Denny Van here with Heartfelt Awakening. Thank you for continuing on this journey with me with Neville Goddard and his lecture series. Today we're going to be going over one of his lectures that is in two parts. The first part is only six pages. So we're going to be breaking down these two parts into several parts. In this first part, this lecture was given on January 8th, 1968, and it's entitled Awake, O Sleeper. And right away in the very first sentence, there is just something within me that goes, oh my gosh, I get it. Oh my gosh, I get it. And what my intention for you is to say, oh my gosh, I get it too. And there's just no words to express this. Feel it, stay with it, listen to the words, experience it. And this one, pay special attention to the book of Ephesians. So again, if you come from a Christian background, you may be open to experiencing the Bible in a different way as opposed to doctrine this is really the bible coming to life within you so awake O oh sleeper neville goddard starts out by saying the bible is addressed to the imagination which is spiritual sensation and only immediately to the understanding or reason. So adding in here that this is relativity. This is from your own perspective, from behind your eyes looking out. And Neville goes on to say, in the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians, we are told to awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. Now, Reason could never comprehend these words, but the Bible is calling upon imagination to awaken, telling him that he is sleeping, dreaming his world into being. But imagination, now a rational being, does not know this and therefore cannot believe it. So adding here, this is so important to understand that he's referring to our rational mind, our rational being. The mind can't wrap itself around this. So this is not for the mind. And this is also the point where you realize you are not the mind. This is a very important place to experience experience where you can see the movement of your mind from this center space of beingness this stillness where you see all the movement happening he goes on to say all of the commands of scripture are addressed to and fulfilled by the lord who is all imagination it is your own wonderful human imagination who is called upon to rouse thyself why sleepest thou o lord awake and that's from psalms 44. the greatest confession of faith man has ever received through revelation is called shama it is recorded in the sixth chapter of deuteronomy as Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord spoken of here is the Elohim, which is a compound unity of one made up of others. I know, for I have stood in his presence. He embraced me and incorporated me into his body. Since that day, back in 1929, I have been one with the body of the risen Lord. I believe we are the God spoken of in the 82nd Psalm, which is quoted in the 10th chapter of John as, 
God has taken his place in the divine assembly. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment saying, you are gods, sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die as men and fall as one man, O prince. You will notice that this statement begins in the past, claiming men are gods, sons of the Most High. Then the future is prophesied as you will fall as one man. This fall was not a punishment, but a plan, a pretense by an assumed appearance in order to conceal the real intention, which is an expansion of further existence, the ultimate birth, having chosen us in himself before the foundation of the world, one man fell, fragmenting itself into the unnumbered men that now appear. We are the gods in disguise who do not recognize our brothers or ourselves. So he's talking about like a holographic universe here, where when one piece breaks, all of the pieces have the same piece in that image, in that hologram. This was back in 1968. And right after around 1966, when Star Trek started, and we started really thinking about this holographic universe theory. And so this is what he's talking about. You will fall as one man. And that it's not a punishment, but a plan. But because we don't recognize our brothers or ourselves, we don't understand that the other images we see is ourself. And Neville goes on to say, in the beginning of Genesis, it is said, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs. God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man who said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she is taken out of man. Therefore, man must leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife as they become one flesh. This statement is myth when viewed through the eyes of reason, but it is true. You will understand it perfectly when it is revealed in you. Having had the vision, I say you have no body distinct from your soul. Your body, that scripture calls Eve, is a portion of the soul discerned by the five senses. The physical body you wear, be it male or female, is emanated by Eve. She is the Jerusalem from above, who is the emanation of the Lord. Although hidden from view, you are so one with Eve that if you were struck and felt pain, you would proclaim, I am in pain, and I am is God's name. Imagination is joined to you, and you are joined to me by our emanated Jerusalems. The Jerusalem from below bears sons into slavery, and the Jerusalem from above bears sons into freedom. When questioned by the Jews, Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise up again 
not understanding, they said, it has taken us 46 years to build this temple and you will rise it up in three days. That's how the minds of man thinks. Thinking of an external thing made with human hands. They did not know that Jesus was speaking of the temple of the soul. Paul knew this, for he questioned the Corinthians saying, Do you not know that you are the temple of the Lord and the spirit of God dwells in you? Eve is your temple, your emanation, and your wife till the sleep of death is past. She is your soul, which God, imagination, cleaves to and has become one with. There is no other Eve. Falling in one body, you entered your cave and met your Savior in the grave. Some found a female garment there, and some a male, woven with care. I found a male garment. My wife found a female garment, but she is not female, and I am not male. For in Christ, there is no male or female, no bond or free, no Greek or Jew, no black or white. Being one with Christ, you, all imagination, are above the organization of eternal death. In his great work called Jerusalem, Blake speaks of the sleep of Albion and his passage through eternal death, which is life as we know it. This world seems to be endless and without purpose. But when a rich man dies, he leaves his wealth behind. And when a poor man dies, he is placed in a pauper's grave. But given the same length of time, their bodies will turn into dust and bones. And no one will be able to distinguish one bone from the other. Regardless of what man seems to achieve here, the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the eyes of the Lord, and the strength of man here is the weakness of God. Yet this world has purpose, for man has to pass through it in order to enter into eternal life. In Blake's poem, Jerusalem, he tells of the sleep of power as it passes through eternal death and of its awakening into eternal life. This theme calls me in sleep night after night. Every morn awakens me at sunrise. Then I see the Savior over me, spreading his beams of love and dictating the words of this mild song. In his letter to Mr. Butts, Blake spoke of this poem saying, I can praise it because I dare not pretend to be anything other than the secretary whose authors are in heaven with the grandest poem this world contains. For the spirit of truth dictated it morning after morning, sometimes 12, sometimes 20 or 50 lines at a time. What now seems to be the labor of a long life was produced without labor or study and quite often against my will. This is how the poem begins. Awake, awake, O oh sleeper in the land of shadows. Wake, expand. I am in you and you in me, mutual in love divine. The being in whom we are contained deliberately fell into this state called death for the purpose of expansion into glorious life. His story is told in the parable of the grain of wheat, 
which unless it falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much. Here is the story of the mystery of life through death being all imagination. If I want an extension of reality, I must contract and die. I must empty myself of the glory I had with the Lord and enter the one body which falls. The world tells us the fall was a mistake, but that is not so. For God planned everything as it has come out and as it will be consummated. One day you will awaken, your mask will come off, and you will be enhanced beyond your wildest dreams as you awaken to eternal life. And when we all awaken, we will know each other more intimately than possible to know one another here. My wife and I often think the same thoughts, but no matter how intimate we may be, we cannot know the intimacy that will be ours when those garments are taken off and we are once more awakened into eternal life. Everyone will awaken in time, but not only by any effort on their part while here. Your awakening was predetermined and it will happen on time, regardless of whether you are shining shoes or employing a million people. Our government undoubtedly has a million people on its payroll with the president at its head. So in a technical sense, he employs a million. Yet tonight, the one who shines his shoes could awaken while the president continues to sleep. Yet no one can die. That is the glorious part. Your body is your emanation. Cut off its head and believing you are it, you will instantly renew the same body, but with no missing parts. So chiming in here, your body is your emanation. Your body is your temple, but it also doesn't belong to us. It really belongs to the earth, right? It's made of all of the same materials. So it, it's on borrowed time. It's your emanation. It's your gift from God. And when he said, cut off its head. So this body tends to uh, react and respond from the reptilian brain, right? So it tends to react and ask questions later. So by saying cut off its head, that's pretty much what we say today. Uh, remove the ego, cut off its head, remove ego, or at least recognize when you are in ego. He goes on to say here that you will instantly, instantly renew the same body, but with no missing parts. Now, when I, when I went through my spiritual awakening, I, people would say, how are you? <laughs> and they hadn't seen me in a while because I kind of went through, you know, disappearing for a couple of years. Like, you know, we kind of do. And I came out and they're like, you know, how are you? It's been a while, blah, blah, blah. And my response used to be, I went to hell and came back Wonder Woman. So they're looking at the same person and in the same body, but inside, completely different. I went to hell and I went through it, but I came back completely different, standing in my power, knowing who I am. And so this is really powerful when you understand when you're in in the space of your emanation within the space of your body and cutting off the ego believing you are it that's what we do so cut off its head and believing you are it you will instantly renew the same body with no missing parts you will step out of the garment you now wear and men will call you dead. So you're gonna let go of your body, 
and your family and your loved ones, they're going to say you're dead. They're going to pronounce you dead. They're going to put a timestamp on it and everything. You're going to get a piece of paper saying that you died. So they're going to call you dead. This is how we see it in the 3D world, in the five sensory world. And Neville goes on to say, but you will have just stepped into another garment with no bridge work, no fillings in your teeth, no gray hair, no need to wear glasses or a hearing aid to discover you are a young man or woman about 20 years of age. And you will be in a terrestrial world just as real as this one and continue your journey until you awaken. I have awakened and know that when this garment is taken off, I will no longer be in this world of death. This world, however, does not terminate at the point where the senses cease to register it. You cannot follow those who are called dead because of your limitations. But your friend who emanated the body you knew here is not dead to himself. Rather, he now emanates the same body, only young, where he continues to dream his world into being, not even knowing he has gone through the door called death. It's like leaving one room and entering another. Your friend is in the same fabulous terrestrial world, which the mysteries call eternal death, and from which he will one day awaken into eternal life. Having descended and entered the world of death, one day he will awaken to discover he has expanded and fulfilled his purpose. God made a limit to contraction and opacity but not to translucency or expansion. So there's a limit. There's only so much you can do in the contracting mode and opacity. There's only so much you can do when it's opaque. It's hard to see through, but there's no limit in clarity, expansion, openness, being crystal clear. So this is very important to understand that there are limits and then in contracted and in our human form, we are contracted. But in our unseen being form, there's no limit here. And Neville goes on to say, in the first chapter of Genesis, it is said, God made man in his own image, male and female made he them. In the second chapter, he changes the somewhat but it is not a contradiction if you see it through imagination. The Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his mouth the breath of life and man became a living soul. Man's destiny is to become a life-giving spirit not just to remain an animated body. The purpose of your fall is to transform and into an entirely different world, one where you are a life-giving spirit, animating everything around you. There you will stop time at will and start it again. That is your destiny. Now, reason cannot understand this, and you can't blame anyone who has not had the vision. Scholars believe the Bible is all myth, and it certainly is. If you take my body apart, you will find no rib that is missing, yet scripture tells us one was removed. The word rib is the Hebrew word Thela, which literally means a portion of the soul that emanates, that leaves everything in cleaves to his emanation until they become one flesh. 
you have cleaved to and become your emanation so completely you believe you are it. When you introduce yourself, you always say, I am, before you give your name. And if you are hurt, you say, I am in pain. Always calling upon the name of God, you don't say, God is in pain, but I am. And that is God's name forever because the gods came down. Now, let me repeat I not only believe in God, I believe that all men are gods and that collective man is God. I believe that when you hurt men, you hurt God. And when you hurt men, you hurt yourself because you are God and there is no other. In spite of the horrors of the world, God is love. When you stand in his presence, you can't feel anything but love. And when love embraces you and you become one with God, you will know an ecstasy you have never known before. And with this union, you are incorporated into his body and know yourself to be all love. So what he's talking about is what we're discovering today and science is discovering this state of coherence. And that's what he's talking about. When you discover this state of coherence within you, healings happen. Um, miracles happen. Uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza does this work. Um, Deepak Chopra talks about everything is within you that you need but we tend to be separated from what it is that we think we need. We think we need the outside help, the doctor to tell us, to give us a diagnosis so that we can have the medication, so that we can get well again. But what we don't see is when we connect and stand, he says, stand in his presence. You can't feel anything but love. This is the state of coherence. This is when the mind and heart are in unity. This is where the Bible says, when two or more are gathered in my name. This is mind and heart, there's the two. Gathered in my name, you create a third frequency. This is where the magic happens, and this is that shift into God's presence. You're standing in God's presence, and you can't help but feel ecstasy. And some people just start crying, they'll start laughing, they'll start shaking. Um, we've had healings where um, a lot of trauma was wanting to come through the body as the person was awakening. So it almost looks like, you know, a, a, um, a, a seizure, maybe it could look like to other people, to the minds of other people who are still asleep and not there they don't understand what's going on so but for somebody who's awakened you can see the nervous system readjusting so it looks like almost an exorcism we've done cranial sacral on people going through this process and releasing past traumas and, and the nervous system is completely uh, resetting itself and this is the kind of stuff where people say miracles happen um, where sudden healings happen, where sudden realizations happen, where you just feel this wonderful ecstasy that you have never known before, but it feels like home, it feels like a union, it feels like you've incorporated into this larger unseen metaphysical part of you, but you've been so separated from because you've been completely asleep in the physical part of you, the constricted a sleep part of you. Now you're opening and expanding and awakening. So, and then you know yourself to be all love. And he goes on to say, he who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Romans 6. When you are incorporated into the body of love, you are united with the one body 
the one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all, knowing that you are he. Then you will awaken as the one who commanded the fall, for you will have fulfilled your purpose. You will awaken in this world of death, knowing you are God, the Father of God's only begotten Son, David. It is recorded that in the spirit David, called Jesus Odane, which is the Hebrew name for Father, Lord. In Hebrew, the name yod he vav he is so sacred, the word Adonai is substituted. In the spirit, David will call you Father, and you will have fulfilled the second psalm. It is David who says, I shall tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. One day, when your time here is fulfilled, you will awaken and be born from above. Then David will appear, and the entire drama of Scripture will unfold within you, revealing your true identity. Then you will know you are one of the gods who agreed to dream in concert. Now dreaming in concert, you and I see a building identically. You may see it through the eyes of one who would like to own it. I may see it through the eyes of one who admires it with no desire of possession. But we see the same building. We see the same streets and recognize the same number so we can go where we want to. But the world is a dream and we are the gods who agree to dream in concert in order not to have any confusion. We had agreed to dream individually and all play solo parts. This would be the wildest maddest play possible. I invite you now to go all out and imagine you really are the man or woman you want to be. But do not doubt, for the minute doubt steps in, a mental division descends as doubt is the devil. If you will believe that regardless of what the world tells you, you are the man you want to be. You won't go mad. Instead, you will become that man. Your dream world will rearrange itself to fit your new image into it without any difficulty or help on your part. So adding in here, this is beautiful because in 1968, um, we really didn't have the terminology like we have with physics and all of the things we learned. And today we have a book, Reality Transurfing, where it talks about transurfing reality. Exactly this, where the world will rearrange itself to fit your new image, but you gotta get clear on your image. We create a slide and you can have many different slides, images. You create an image, you put your focus, awareness, attention on it, get very, very clear, activate your plates, open up your angel wings and just sit with this and you give it to God. This is the dream world. And then without any difficulty or help on your part, the world will rearrange itself to fit your image. And this is what we call miracles and they happen. And Neville goes on to say, when someone born into poverty persists in dreaming he possesses great wealth and his dream comes true. His wealth seems perfectly natural to those who do not know his dream. You are dreaming. If you try to make your dream come true while doubting its possibility, you are headed toward a nervous breakdown. But if you go all out in your wonderful claim, you will fulfill it. For all things are possible to the God you are, 
for you are the God of whom the Bible speaks. When the gods came down in the likeness of men, some found a female garment and some a male, entering death's door with those who enter and lying down in the grave with the visions of eternity. The gods are dreaming the dream of life until they awake and see Jesus and the linen clothes which were woven with the cooperation of the male and female. These were emanations of the soul, which is neither male nor female. As it was appointed for all men to die once, and after that comes the judgment. So Christ was offered once for the sins of many, and will appear a second time, not concerning sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Hebrews 9. You may hear of someone's death, but he has not died to himself, as it was appointed that all men would die only once. We died when we left our heavenly home to come down and assume the limitations of the flesh. At that moment, we were united with Christ in a death like his, with the promise that we would be united with him in the resurrection like his. Your death is over. When you go through the gate called death, you don't die, but instantly emanate a young, unaccountably new body. Most of those who go through the gate do not even know it. They simply take their young body for granted, just as they do everything here. All day long, a miracle goes on in your body, unknown to your conscious reasoning mind Tonight's dinner is being converted into blood, tissue, and bones. No man can make a drop of blood, grow a new heart, or make one hair on his head. The other day it was recorded that a doctor had stated that his patient could not live three weeks without a heart transplant. He operated on the man, gave him a new heart, and the man lived 18 days. No matter what the doctors do, no man will live one hour beyond his span of time, as told us in the Sermon on the Mount. Who is being anxious can add one hour to his span of life, yet man goes blindly on believing he can. All he is doing is publicizing his surgeons and the medical world. You are not the body you wear. So when it's heart, liver, or lungs wear out, you will simply step out of it and emanate a new one. Made in the image of God, you are God's prodigal son who came out from the father. You have cleaved to the body you wear so tightly, you have become one flesh with it so that whenever it is hurt, you are hurt. This is the Adam and Eve of scripture. Therefore, it is not a myth. Your emanation does come out of you, but not from a rib. You have no body distinct from your soul. Your called body is a portion of soul discerned by the five senses, the chief inlet of soul in this age. You are now a living soul destined to become a life-giving spirit. Having fallen, you emanate a body, which is necessary to function in this world, and you automatically do it with not one part missing. I meet those who have left this time and space and do not even know they are dead. If I told you right now that you are not only sound asleep, but you are also dead, would you think me mad and the possessor of a demon? That's what they said of the risen Christ. 
Why listen to him? He is mad and has a demon. Taking up stones to stone him, they say, we stone you for blasphemy, for you are being a man, claim you are God. Then he replies, is it not written in your law? I say you are God's. If he calls you gods to whom the word of God came, then why do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world that he blasphemes? John 10. Jesus never claimed he was greater than another. Those who heard him did not know they were God, and he was only trying to awaken them to the memory that they were the sons who came down. He said, go tell my brothers, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. He never claimed that his father differed from theirs or that his God was different, but they could not understand the mystery. They tried to grasp it with the reasoning mind, yet everything takes place in the imagination, which is God. Man is all imagination and God is man and exists in us and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination and that is God himself, William Blake. Now let us go into silence. Thank you for staying with me and joining me in these lectures from Neville Goddard. And in January in 1968, I was like a year and a half, two years old in between there. And um, reading these and knowing where I am now, this is timeless information. It might be old. <laughs> Wait, what am I saying? <laughs> it might be very old, but it's timeless information. And this imagination, even Albert Einstein was a very strong supporter of cultivating creativity and imagination. And he was worried about our children not being able to use their imagination. And here, right here, Neville Goddard is saying, imagination is spiritual sensation. So this is like one of our internal senses. We might call it a sixth sense, but I think we have many sixth senses, right? I have internal auditory. Um, I hear things inside hearing chimes and music inside. And you know it's imagination. And so imagination is spiritual sensation. And so when my imagination is telling me something, it's coming from spirit. And as we go through these, we're going to continue on in the next part where we go on for part two of Awake, O Sleeper. But this one is 19 pages, and this one was given in uh, July 25th of 1968, and it is 19 pages. So this part two of Awake, O Sleeper, part two, we're probably going to break it down into um, some chunks. So this might continue to be uh, parts two, three, and possibly four or five. So we want to take this in a nice small chunk so that we can digest it. This is spiritual food. And so you want to just sit with this, not so much to get the knowledge and the know-how and the words, but to experience it. That means you got to digest it a little bit, get it down into your soul. This is true spiritual food and we need this. We are going through some times right now and this is a great time to you know, if we're repeating time, sometimes I think we're repeating history, but if, if that is the case, we might as well talk about these lectures that were done 
back in the 50s and 60s. So I do appreciate you being on this journey with me. Be sure to subscribe, like, comment, ask us any questions. If there's any lectures that you want to hear of, if you have any comments about these, we want to hear from you. Thank you for joining me at Heartfelt Awakening Radio, and I look forward to seeing you next time.